Hi, I'm Michelle Heyman. I'm a practice manager for a family support team based in Hastings. I'm also the co-chair for the Ethnic Staff Minority Forum and I'm also a member of the Race Equality Pilot Group. So hello, I'm Alison Jeffrey. I'm the Director of Children's Services for East Sussex County Council. So Alison, some may argue that racism doesn't exist, that it's just poverty. Um, but do you feel racial inequality exists within East Sussex? Yes, I do. I'll come on to the link with poverty. But I think for me, the evidence to say, yes, it's a problem, is both what people tell us, what um, you and your colleagues have told us about what you experience, how you feel. That is really important evidence for me. Um, but also we've got the data on things like exclusions from schools that um, black Caribbean children are 8% um, excluded at least once and, and white children 3% excluded at least once, uh, Irish travellers 15% excluded at, at least once. Those data are a sort of can opener for asking questions but they are really important so you know, yes I do think it's a problem. Is it the case that a lot of global majority people live in poverty? Yes. Yeah. Is it a case that poverty restricts your life chances? Absolutely. But they are two separate issues. And I think it's really important not to get into an argument about which disadvantage, which inequality somehow is more important than, than others. You know, Each of them needs to be looked at on their own. Um, and then we also need that intersectionality which looks at the fact that some people suffer from a number of those different uh, issues. So I, th I think it absolutely is a problem that we still need to do a lot of work on. So Alison, can you tell me how East Sussex recognises the power imbalances that people from ethnic minority groups may experience? It's a really important question um, and we know from what people have told us how they feel that there is that power imbalance there, definitely. And I think the, the work that you've been involved in, um, the, the forum, the um, Global Majority Staff, Ethnic Minority Staff Forum that, that, that you've been involved in, mm. um, I'm really encouraged by the, the thinking that's that's gone on there and the fact that we've been able to make some changes so looking at new policies for uh, addressing what you know actually knowing what to do when people report discrimination at work and we're also I know looking at what we need to do when colleagues experience racism from families in the course of their work and these are really important practical things that I think will you know, gradually help us to, to make a difference. Uh, I think the training and awareness raising that we've done, and I think it's about 400 plus staff now who've been uh, had awareness training and managers having training in anti-racism. Uh, we've done a deep dive into recruitment, looking at our last couple of social worker recruitment rounds. You know, are we happy that what we're doing you know, really is free from bias, discrimination, racism. Uh, I think that those pieces of work, you know, are going to help us to move forward. Um, we've also recognised that we need to reframe our guidance to schools about mm -hmm. racial equality because originally that was about uh, resilience for children experiencing racism and. And now it's actually about challenging stereotypes and, cha and being anti-racist. You know, that's much more proactive. So I think we are recognising that the problem exists and trying to be more on the front foot in uh, changing it, in, in addressing it and thinking in, in all the, the ways, small ways and big ways of addressing those um, power imbalances. There is a absolutely power imbalance there um, and we can see that in the underrepresentation of, of the staff within East Sussex which I know you know there are many things in place that we're trying to kind of redress that balance but thinking about my father's experiences you know he moved here um, from West Africa in the 80s 
you worked extremely hard, um, joined East Sussex and, and trained to become the first black social worker in, in East Sussex. But that wasn't without a lot of difficulties mm, along yeah. the way. And each time he tried to go for a promotion, he faced a lot of difficulties. And whether that was no support from his peers, whether that was from being given a job and then the next day that being withdrawn, um, you know, to, to experience in racist comments quite overtly mm. um, and, and people not talking to him when he did did receive a promotion. So he, he faced a number of challenges, but he worked for the department for 25 years. And, you know, in his book, he outlines some of those experiences, but he also outlines how changes had been made throughout his time with East Sussex. And he wouldn't have stayed, actually, if he hadn't have felt that there had been mm. some improvements. But I, th I think his parting thoughts were that because of who he was and, and, and being a man of colour, he, he felt that actually he, he had limitations on how far mm. he could rise within management. And, mm. you know, he, he reached practice manager level, but he, he felt that he never would have achieved much more than that, despite having those ambitions. Um, and he's... You know, he's pleased to see the, the developments and he's come back and he's offered training to staff oh, you brilliant. know in that area he's done webinars so he's very much in support of Fantastic. east sussex and, and the you changes can watch that are... your career as you absolutely move yes yeah. yes he's hoping i will break the glass ceiling for him of course, him. He, will. Of course so, he will fantastic yeah. that, that's really really interesting i'm interested as well in in what the group felt about being involved asked to be part of the solution because sometimes you know, yeah. I understandably hear that people say, actually, you're looking to us to be the mm -hmm. solution. You're the ones who need to be the solution. I mean, how, how do people in the group feel about that? And what are, they, what are their reflections on power imbalance in the department? Yeah, so when we first heard about th this co-design project, a few of us were quite sceptical. Mm -hmm. We thought, mm -hmm. is, it, yeah, is this about us solving the problem? But also, you know, was this a tokenistic gesture? Mm -hmm. And were the contributions that we were going to make, were they going to result in any kind of change and, and action being taken forward? But having spoken to the members of the group, we all said, we thought that could be possible, but we're going to come with an open mind. So let's hear what the proposals are. Let's hear what, you know, what input that we are going to have and how that may make some change. So we were all open minded. And I think I could speak for the majority of us that say we want to be part of the solution. And actually, if we want things to change, we have to help steer the change as well. Mm. And actually, mm. that's where we go back to the allyship, is yeah. that if yeah. we're not part of that change, how can we create the allyship yeah. and how can we all move forward Two together? Two people need to be in an alliance, don't they? Absolutely, yeah. for it to work. Yeah. So for me, being part of the project was extremely empowering. And because we were having regular updates of the progress that was mm. being made, we can see new policy developments mm. that I've helped roll out mm. to, to other managers. Mm. You can see the change happening, so it, it does feel, Good. you know, like we've been valued and, and listened to. So I'm really pleased that, you know, I went in with an open mind and I think I could speak for most of the group would, would feel the same way. And I will encourage others to do the same if further opportunities arise. Thank you. That's so fantastic. Thank you so much. And I'm just hugely grateful to all the staff who've been involved in, in the group for giving up their time and sharing their experiences. You know, it's just so, so valuable. So thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> So, Alison, can you tell me a bit about how East Sussex is trying to cultivate a culture that values difference um, from people with different backgrounds? It's so important that, and I think we're just at the beginning in a way. Um, for me, I think people know psychological safety is a really important value, um, and I've talked a lot about that. And actually, that came from reading the Virtual College report on the urgency of now, because they were really underlining the importance of people feeling they could bring them their whole selves to work and that they were psychologically safe in making the fullest possible contribution. Um, and that's really important so that people don't feel held back. But actually, we need to kind of do more so that we really make the most of what they're bringing to work and, and, and the different perspectives that they have and you know, searching for diversity, bringing diversity into our work. Uh, is is really really important yeah. uh, I think we you know we we've got to listen to people hear from people about the different approaches we might be able to to have for that mm -hmm. I mean things like uh, Tony's webinar yesterday on notable black Caribbeans that was really great but it's like a one-off isn't it and we yeah. we we actually need to be thinking whenever we're having a discussion with staff whenever we're having a 
strategy meeting about children you know how how many voices are we hearing are we are we hearing everybody's voice equally here and are there are there real talents and real perspectives that we're just not not taking in because we we haven't heard from them so i i don't want to claim that we've cracked this at all i think we've got quite a long way to go i don't know whether you've got any thoughts on how we could do yeah. this better I think it really starts with the sort of manager supervisee relationship and trying to get a good understanding of, of each other's journeys and mm. being able to have that open dialogue mm. about their experiences, what what they bring, what yeah. they bring, you know, bring to their work and, and the impact of some of their experience, you know, what that has on them and how they can relate to the families that they work with yeah. uh, as well as with their colleagues. I think it's very difficult for some people to have those conversations and it really does need to be modelled, you know, by managers yeah. with yeah. their teams to kind of change that culture and actually let's have those open discussions. Yeah. Let's let's not make it scary. Let's yeah. just show some interest. People really want to hear from me. Yeah. Um, I can feel perfectly safe in, in talking in so. about experiences which are important to me and yeah. which I think are relevant yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I mean, part of what I do as a team manager with our team meetings that we have, we, we, you know, they're a very safe space. You know, we use that. We, we've talked about the social graces. So thinking about all aspects of yeah. people's lives and yeah. the impact that has on them. You know, we, we look at that, about how that impacts on the families that they also work with. Yeah. And we try to use that as a, a really safe space to explore ourselves and learn about each other. And I think that that's something that you know ought to be encouraged for for all teams to be thinking about that and, and doing those things. We probably need to do a video of your team meeting for people <laughs> to look at. No, seriously, I do yeah. think you know this this is is just really really important. Yeah, I agree absolutely. Yeah. So, Alison, what what does being a good ally for race equality mean to you? There's a lot of resources which people can access about this now. Um, you know, I'm not an expert and I use those resources like everybody else. You know, the the video that I sent around recently um, in my weekly message uh, with a TED talk about three ways to be a good ally, starting from understanding, then uh, going on to advocating and then looking at what you might do with uh, somebody's individual prospects and lives that you could make better. Personally, I think I'm like a lot of people. Before 2020, I knew it mattered. I said all the right things. I believed all the right things, I thought. But I don't think I really, really thought about it very much. And it was only really in 2020 with the death of George, George Floyd that I started to think I really need to understand a bit more about this. And fortunately, there's an organization called the Virtual College, mm -hmm. which does staff development for leaders in children's services. And they got working and produced a really great sort of resource pack um, called the Fierce Urgency of Now. And it came out at a good time for me when I was moving between Portsmouth and East Sussex. Uh, and and it was a really good moment to just think, actually, I really need to properly un understand that. And one of the resources that that document pointed me to was Rennie Edo Lodge's book, Why I'm Not Talking to White People About Race Anymore. And I got that on Audible. And I'd be listening to Rennie in, in her own voice, you know, talking about these really difficult issues. And I just realised you know, that I needed to do a lot more thinking and if I was to be a good ally, I needed to understand a lot more. And I think, you know, I realised it was starting with me, actually, um, and what I thought and knew and understood and being really humble about that and really wanting to listen and, and, and really hear. So I think for me, that is the most important thing that we can all do. Um, but there's a, there's a rather good uh, graph, which I think people have seen before on... Um, the webinar that East Sussex did last year about how you move from being in the understanding place to being in the growth place and learning and in, into transformation. So you sort of fan out, you know, you start with yourself and then you think about all your interactions with other people and then the more structural things and policies and procedures and, and action that, that starts to make a difference because obviously it's not good enough 
just to say, well, yeah, I've, I've understood, I've listened, I've heard, right, but what are you actually going to do? You know, what what is your role? And and I do think for people like me in the position that I'm in, there's a really heavy responsibility to, to try to act as well as just understand. But I would say I'm like everyone else in, in that learning phase at the moment. So I think I agree with a lot of the, the points that you've already made about um, allyship. For me, it does go beyond that listening. It, it is about taking some action and about others showing up for other people, speaking up for other people and, and you know, not letting either racist comments or microaggressions slide, mm. but actively challenging and supporting yeah. their colleagues. So I, I do think a lot of people are on a spectrum and a lot of people are very interested and they've listened and they've asked about people's journeys but it's about taking it that step further that for me step, yeah. um, of, of actually taking some action yeah. is what is important for me yeah no, I get that completely yeah. so, so what happens when the the race equality pilot comes to an end and how are children's services going to continue the, the progress and the work that is made in terms of race equality for the staff I think there's two things Michelle firstly um, we're all really hoping that there'll be a number of sort of products, things that the group has managed to achieve with us, um, changes in policy that we take back to the equalities board that's being set up corporately for East Sussex, so that there's um, a legacy of the work in terms of tangible things that people can point to. But I also think, you know, two years um, is absolutely nothing in addressing centuries of discrimination uh, and so we can't really just stop the work actually um, I think we have to keep finding a way for people to have the discussions yeah. it's not a sort of one-off a task and finish job isn't it tackling racism it's a commitment a sort of lifelong commitment Absolutely. that everybody needs so we need to find ways of keeping having the discussion We've been able to provide some facilitation. Let's see whether we can still do that going forward or whether there's other ways. You know, I really want to, to see it continue because I think there's so many important issues to explore. I mean, one thing, you know, we, we've all, all been working in this hybrid way. You know, what's that done to relationship building? What's that done to our understanding of each other as colleagues? You know, how do we combat some of the disadvantages of being at home quite a lot of the time and maybe sort of stuck in our own echo chamber. I would absolutely like to see the, the good work continuing and whether this group, you know, is able to continue that work in, in some other form. Um, but absolutely, I would want to be part of that. And I think it's really important that this work continues. And like you say, it doesn't just stop because the pilot has stopped. Um, it does need to be an ongoing commitment to making change. And those involved really want to to be part of that and, and see that continue. I would really like to see the Ethnic Staff Forum really, you know, get off the ground and really be developed and be well attended on a, on a regular basis. And I think that that's a really important space for staff to kind of go and, and gain support. But we also need to have um, an increase in that kind of allyship. Mm -hmm. So whether there is a, a whole staff forum where we, we can look at that mm -hmm. in developing the allyship, mm -hmm. Um, but I, I do think there's a place for, for all of those things and I would like to be part of all of those moving forward and really hope that the department will continue to support those projects continuing. Definitely we will. Thank you. Thank you.